All right, well, um, we're missing one of our speakers, um, but it is 8.30, so I think we will get started, and when she comes in, we can slot her in. So, um, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan here in Tokyo. Um, I'm Anthony Rowley. I'm a former president of the club, and I shall be acting as moderator today. Um, um, with today's discussion is on what I think is a very to important and topical subject, which is that of climate change uh, and the impact that this could have on the global economy and on the financial system. Uh, so we'd like to offer a very warm welcome to our four expert panelists um, who are joining us from various different parts of the world. Um, so I'll introduce them uh, one by one. Um, so live from Washington, we have um, Florence Jomot, who is Deputy Division Chief in the Research Department of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Um, we're waiting for Sonia Gibbs. So, and from Manila in the Philippines, we have Wu Chong Um, uh, who is the Director General and of the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department at the Asian Development Bank, ADB. And from China, Beijing, we have Mr. Frank Bellitz, um, who is Principal Officer in the Strategy and Policy Department of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB. Well, thank you all again very much for being with us today. And a special thanks to you, Florence, uh, for taking a part of your evening uh, to be with us at our breakfast time. Um, I apologize for having to ask the panelists to keep strictly to 15 minutes in their presentations um, because we have a number of panelists and we want to leave time if possible for some questions at the end. Um, if any of the panelists wish, wishes to stop short of 15 minutes, that's fine, no problem, because that will give us more time for discussion at the end. So we'll move on to the speaker's presentations now, but just very quickly first, I'd like to mention a comment which was made recently by the managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva. Uh, she said that as the world emerges from COVID-19 pandemic, it faces what she called an even greater threat, that of climate change. And this, she says, represents a fundamental risk to economic and financial stability. So with those rather sobering words in mind, I'd like to invite Florence first to um, give your presentation. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning. And, you know, thank you for the invitation to speak here today. I will try to share my screen. Um, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Is it possible to, to change that? Let me start and uh, hopefully this okay, will Okay, yes, yes, I'm, I'm sure it's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Change at the center of its work. While the window for limiting temperature increases to safe levels is closing rapidly, and as IMF Managing Director said recently, climate change represents a fundamental risk to economic and financial stability. Sorry. The increase in uh, rich temperature over the surface of the Earth uh, relative to pre-industrial levels has been uh, about estimated at one degree Celsius, and it is believed to be accelerating. Oh, I see. Under under unchanged policies, oh. temperatures could further increase by between two and five degrees Celsius by the end of this century, which would impose growing uh, physical and economic damage and could increase the, the risk of catastrophic outcomes. Now, estimates of these damages vary, um, but more recent estimates that take into account... I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think if you put the slides on your screen, we can see them. Okay, perfect. Yep. Let me just share right now then. Yes. Ah, yes, that looks okay. better. And let, let me make it in bigger okay. font here. 
So as I was saying, temperatures could increase significantly by the end of this century, uh, creating uh, severe uh, economic damages with different estimates available, but the more recent estimates point to larger damages of the order of possibly even 25% uh, of output. Now, what damages can we expect from climate change? Um, there are a number of uh, different channels. The first one is, of course, productivity declines uh, in agricultural crops or fish farming, also due to hotter temperatures in which you know, people who work outside have to work. Another channel is through greater disruptions uh, in economic activity and supply chains and greater destruction of capital, physical capital, whether productive capital, infrastructure, buildings, due to natural disasters and uh, for coastal areas rise in sea levels. Related to this, climate change is likely to lead to a diversion of resources uh, towards adaptation and reconstruction. Another channel through which climate change might affect us is a deterioration of health and even possible life losses due to natural disasters, but also an increased prevalence of infectious diseases as temperatures increase. There, we may also expect migration pressures over the coming decades. A recent study found that absent climate change mitigation by 2070, mean temperatures could be above 29 degrees Celsius uh, in about 20% of the Earth, as opposed to less than 1% currently, uh, affecting a third of the global population. Last but not least, there is the risk of catastrophic outcomes related to reaching tipping points, which, is, uh, which are abrupt and irreversible changes in Earth systems, uh, which, which could have uh, devastating damage. Now, scientists have warned that um, to be safe, temperature increases should be kept below two degrees Celsius and if possible, closer to one and a half degrees Celsius. And this objective uh, was endorsed worldwide at the 2015 Paris Agreement. What this means in practice is that um, emissions of greenhouse gases have to be reduced to about net zero by 2050. Now, you could think that the current pandemic and the economic crisis makes it more challenging to act on climate change. But it may also uh, present a unique opportunity to build back better and green the recovery. On the one hand, the recovery stimulus can be designed uh, to, to finance a green and resilient public infrastructure. On the other hand, policies can ensure that the composition of recovery in private capital spending is consistent with decarbonization by providing correct price signals and financial incentives. So against this backdrop, uh, the latest World Economic Outlook from the IMF published in October looked at how to design climate mitigation in a growth, employment, and distributional friendly way. Let me say a few words about the different types of policies that governments have um, uh, available. Broadly speaking, we can distinguish two broad types of policies. On the one hand, carbon pricing, and on the other hand, green supply policies. Carbon pricing is putting a price on carbon, and this can be done by directly taxing carbon or by setting up a carbon emissions trading scheme. Yet another way of doing this is regulation, because regulation put an implicit price on carbon. The other types of policies is green supply policies. And what that means, these are policies that make the supply of low carbon energy more abundant and uh, less expensive. Now, this can include subsidies or price guarantees in the low carbon energy sectors, uh, direct public investment, in infrastructure or technologies which are low carbon. It can also include green R&D subsidies. The argument we make in the World Economic Outlook is that when combined, these green supply policies 
and carbon pricing can in principle prompt substantial declines in emissions without a major hit to economic activity. And the, the package we look at is a comprehensive policy package with four main legs. The first one is this green supply policies and the main component here is a 10 year green uh, public investment program. The second, uh, the second leg of the package is carbon pricing, which is pre-announced and um, gradually introduced uh, to give agents, economic agents, firms, households time to adjust uh, to the change in the price of carbon. The third leg of the package is compensatory transfers to households to make sure the transition to a low carbon economy is as inclusive as possible. And we allow uh, some recycling of carbon tax revenues in terms of targeted transfers to poor households. Last but not least is supportive macroeconomic policy. So the package uh, initially involves fiscal easing. So there is some debt financing of the public investment, but which occurs in an environment of low for long interest rates given the low inflation context. Now, we, we use this comprehensive policy package and we, we simulate it using global macro models and we use this to try to illustrate the main mechanisms at play and provide an illustrative order of uh, magnitude. Let me tell you what the main takeaway is of the, the, the study. The main takeaway is that such a comprehensive policy package does actually boost output and employment in the initial years supporting the recovery from the pandemics. And thereafter, the costs of the transition are relatively moderate. Now, as you can see on the left-hand side, it's the impact on emissions. Emissions are reduced substantially from their baseline level in, in red, and both the green stimulus and the carbon tax contribute to this. But you can also see that a lot of the work is done by, by the carbon tax. The reason for this is that the carbon tax does not only change how expensive high carbon you know, um, activity is relative to low carbon, but it also increases the overall price of energy. And this incentivizes energy efficiency throughout the economy. So one of the findings of the chapter is that the carbon tax is definitely a key element of a mitigation package. In the middle chart, we illustrate the effects on economic activity output all the way to 2050. If you focus on the red diamond, that shows you the net effect. And what you can see is that the, in the initial years, the boost from this uh, green investment is, um, is superior to the drag on economic activity from the carbon tax in blue. So you get a boost to economic activity and employment. This green fiscal stimulus is important for two reasons. You know, it does add to aggregate demand in a period now when economic activity is depressed. And the other reason it's important is that this investment in low carbon sectors by, by the public sector does tend to make them more productive and therefore makes um, private investment more uh, attractive. Over time, as the carbon tax is increased, the drag on economic activity increases as well, generating uh, output losses, but small output losses. By 2050, it's about 1% of what output would have been you know, under unchanged policies. This is very manageable if you consider that over the next 30 years, the world economy is expected to grow by 120%. So this package reduces you know, output by 1% from this 120% increase. In addition, if you take into account what we call co-benefits, these are additional benefits that you get from mitigation policies in terms of reducing local air pollution and therefore leading to better health outcomes, the package is neutral uh, globally. That's what you can see in the black dot. In, in this chart. Now, over time, 
the policy package puts the world economy on a higher output path compared to what would have happened under unchanged policies. And this is because we are avoiding the severe damages from climate change in the second half of the century. Florence, if I could ask you to speak for three minutes, please, three minutes. <laughs> yes, sure. Uh, two main points here, just to show that for Japan, the outcomes are even more positive. So the boost to economic activity is even larger than on average for the world economy. And to emphasize that when we take into account the response of technology to the policy incentives that are put in place, which is on the right hand side, the transitional output costs are even smaller than they would be. So technology is definitely a key element uh, of, of, of the transition. The package is also, the policy package is also rich in employment. It creates about 12 million jobs on average for the first seven years. And part of this is the stimulus that is given to the economy, but the other part is also that the low carbon sectors are more job rich than the high carbon sectors. And you can see here on the right hand side, job multipliers by sector, subsectors in the energy. Uh, last point I wanna make here is that although, you know, on average, initially the, the, the policy package is a net positive for employment, you see that there is a big reallocation of jobs from high carbon sectors to low carbon sectors. And these transitions can be difficult for some workers and there is a role for the government to play here. This brings me to the last, uh, the last part of, of the analysis we did, which is to look at how to make this transition to a low carbon economy inclusive. First, let's no, not note that low income income households are more likely to be impacted by uh, carbon taxation. First, because they spend a relatively larger share of their income on energy intensive goods, but also because they tend to be employed in low skill occupations in carbon intensive sectors. If you see on the right hand side, um, opinion polls show that the support for the environment is the lowest for unskilled workers in high carbon occupations. The good news is that there are policies government can use to protect low-income households. Uh, we find that redistribu redistributing about a sixth to a quarter of the carbon tax revenues in targeted transfers to the 20th uh, poorest household, 20% uh, poorest households, is enough to offset the impact uh, of the carbon tax on them. In addition, governments can use part of the revenues to increase spending on low carbon sectors. And that brings me back to the idea of a green uh, fiscal stimulus to support job creation in those new sectors. In conclusion, reaching net zero emissions by 2050 is a feasible objective that would boost incomes in the long run and avoid catastrophic risk. But the window is rapidly closing we see uh, two main elements to a policy package. The first one is an initial green investment push combined second one, the secondly with steadily rising carbon prices. This would deliver the needed emissions reduction at reasonable cost, even boosting output and employment in the first decade. Last but not least, a fair transition requires compensating the lower income households for these higher prices and supporting this job transition towards uh, low carbon sectors. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, it was comforting to, to hear you use the word manageable. Okay, um, we'll turn now to Wu Chong Um in um, Manila. Um, obviously, climate change is, is not something that uh, you know, stops at national borders, but. Nevertheless, could you talk about the particular challenge that Asia faces in um, as we uh, approach this period of climate change? Please go ahead, Wu Chong. Yes, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, fine. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan for organizing this really relevant event. Um, and great to see, um, especially our ADB's friend, Anthony Rowley, 
uh, who's been with us for last, I don't know, as long as I can remember in, you know, talking about these issues. Oh. And also wonderful to hear insights from the colleagues on the panel as well and, and later. <clears throat> Um, so ADV has been in the business of eradicating poverty since 1966, over 50 years. And together with our partners, we've been you know, quite successful. Um, but can we continue to success in the midst of climate change? It really depends on what we do now. So our region is extremely vulnerable and impacts of climate change are already being felt all over the region. You know, for example, seven of the 10 countries most affected by extreme weather patterns are in this region in the last uh, 20 years. And according to the IPCC report, they predict that the sea level rise of two meters would result in significant land loss by 20, uh, 2100, displacing estimated over 180 million people, mostly in Asia. And according to UNDP, many countries in our region are recording hottest temperatures in history. For example, Pakistan and India have already seen blistering temperatures above 50 degrees in 2019. And our region is also the largest CO2 emission um, leaders in the world, accounting for over 53% of the global emissions. And while this emission from Asia is still rising, the growth in emissions has slowed down, fortunately, in our region um, in the last um, 10 years or so because of the heavy investments in renewable energy in our region. So uh, from 2000-2010, um, average growth rate um, in CO2 emission was uh, almost 8%. But the next 10 years, uh, the basic last 10 years, average growth rate has decreased to 2.7%. So that's a very, very good news. The global and regional warming will induce changes highly relevant to human and ecological well-being and economic development with our, with our region, within our region. So this is really, really important to ADB's work. So unabated warming could significantly undo many previous achievements of economic development and improvements of living standards with huge economic losses. The Global Commission on Adaptation estimates that climate change could push more than 100 million people below the poverty line in developing countries by 2030. And that's a significant issue for us because we are just starting our next 10-year um, long-term strategy called Strategy 2030. So climate change obviously is one of the key pillars of our strategy. So without building resilience through adaptation efforts, climate change may depress growth in global agriculture yields up to 30% by 2050. Number of people who may lack sufficient clean water will soar from 3.6 billion today to more than 5 billion by 2050. And rising seas and growing greater storm surges could force hundreds of millions of people in coastal cities from their homes. This means that the total cost of coastal urban areas of more than 1 trillion each year by 2050. So these are stark numbers that we have to be very, very conscious of in our doing our work. And moreover, estimates from the Global Commission on Economy and Climate show that strong climate action has potential to generate over 65 million new low carbon jobs which would produce over $26 trillion in net global economic benefits. And most importantly, it would help avoid over 700,000 premature new deaths from the air pollution. Given the significant physical and economic impacts, the importance of climate change abatement actions can be seen in all of the 41 developing member countries of our Asia Development Bank. They all have ratified the Paris Agreement and most submitted intended nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement. And that's a hu huge feat. The, our next COP26 in November, the commitment to climate change can also be seen internationally. Of course, it's a welcome news that one of the most first actions of the new US president was to return to the Paris Agreement. Further, there have been ambitious carbon emission targets set by many countries around the world. And I'm very, very proud to see my many Asian countries leading this effort. Of course, Japan is committed to strive to achieve a decarbonized society as close to possible to 2050, while Republic of Korea has declared to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And China has also committed 60% to 65% carbon emission intensity reduction by 2030 from 2005 levels and carbon neutrality by 2060. 
this means that the CO2 emission will need to peak at around 2030. So we have a very interesting 10 years to go. So in this regard, what are we doing in ADB for the next 10 years? Uh, under our strategy 2030, climate change is one of the two pillars of, um, of our strategy. The other one is gender mainstreaming. And ADB continues to scale up its operation to more effectively support its developing member countries in meeting their commitment under Paris Agreement through strategic advice, innovative financing, disseminating knowledge, and building partnerships. ADB underscores its commitments with this strategy 2030 by setting ambitious targets on climate change. Our target is that by 2030, we will ensure that at least 75% of all our projects will be supporting climate change mitigation or adaptation. And in terms of money, we're a bank at the end of the day, so we do, we do care about how much money we commit. And it means that at least $80, 80 billion dollars of climate finance from our own resources will be dedicated to climate for the next 10 years. Besides the strategic commitment, ADB will continue to facilitate access to global climate funds for our developing countries, such as the Climate Investment Funds, Green Climate Fund, and also carbon market, because that's a very important source of, of financing for climate. So moreover, ADB's also working jointly with the multilateral development banks, the MDBs, to align ourselves, our operations to the goals of the Paris Agreement, committing to a common alignment approach and supporting developing countries to achieve low greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development pathways. So the public sector can do this alone. So while the commitment of national governments are very important and needed, it is also absolutely essential to crowd in the private capital and knowledge in our work. There's a remarkable incentive to invest in fighting climate change and ADB is increasingly working with the private sector businesses and financial sectors to leverage climate finance. In 2019, of its over $7 billion climate finance that ADB provided, over $500 million were committed to private borrowers and this leveraged a little over $2 billion to climate related co-financing from private sources. ADB supports the development of green bond as well. Um, and in that market, we are playing a role of an anchor investor, designing guarantees and mobilizing green investment funds, as well as supporting issuers to ensure that green bond comply with relevant frameworks. In addition, ADB has long-standing engagement with the carbon market providing technical capacity building and carbon finance to support greenhouse gas emission activities in the region through the carbon market program. Unlike many other carbon funds, ADB's carbon market programs generally provide upfront financing, not upon, upon the generation of the carbon, carbon credit. So it actually causes project new, more projects to happen. ADB is also acknowledging the importance of ESGs over the last 10 years, there has been an increase in the understanding and, and disclosure of the physical, traditional, transitional, and liability climate risks to business operations and consequently the investors. However, the depth of this integration into firms' valuation and investment making process still varies considerably, and short term horizons for investment management make it challenging to measure the impact of long term risks. Investors, both public, private, public and private, need to encourage appropriate disclosure on climate change risks from companies, but they also need to work with regulators to ensure that they are um, taking uh, valuing the risk correctly. And of course, impact of COVID-19. Uh, part of my role as um, uh, Director General for Sustainable Development is to be the COVID-19 coordinator across the bank. So uh, we are able to balance the actions of climate change as well as the work we need to do under, uh, under COVID-19. So when we talk about ch ch challenges of climate change today, we also have to consider COVID-19 pandemic because it, it's, it has a, such a severe impact on the region's economy. The ADB's now analysis estimates that potential economic impact of Asia and the Pacific estimated at 2.7 trillion. Further, we are also seeing the impact of COVID-19 on climate action. COVID-19 has impacted climate action by way of delaying COP26 from last year to this year and rolling back some of the environment regulations and recovery support 
for carbon int intensive industries without conditionalities. And even in ADB, um, it, from 2019, we had about $7 trillion of climate investment. Last year, it, it dropped to about $5, five billion. Uh, but we expect this to uh, pick, up, pick up again over the next uh, couple of years. And finally, ADB is actively supporting its developing member countries in responding to the severe impact of COVID-19 through its $20 billion assistance package earlier. And in December 2020, ADB also announced, launched the $9 billion vaccine initiative, Asia Pacific Vaccine Access Facility, APVAX, which offers rapid equitable support to its DMC, developing member countries. They procure and deliver effective and safe COVID-19 vaccines. So apart from strengthening the health systems and strong incomes, we have to work very closely with the developing countries to help them rebuild and recover in, in the green way. And we've seen some positive movements. You know, people are now more used to working remotely. So, you know, we are able to um, put in a proper uh, infrastructure so that people don't have to commute and um, cause additional CO2 emission. But there are also some challenges in terms of behavior change. Um, over the last year, until before the pandemic, you know, more and more people in our region were opting to take public transport. But during 2020, um, in the midst of uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the use of private vehicles you know, spiked up again. So in our next new norm, transport support, we have to see how we can encourage um, people to go back to public transport and be, get back into the efficient mode of transport. And we can do that certainly with proper social distancing and, and efficiency. So we have a huge work ahead of us and economic recovery and interventions can deliver strong economic and social benefits in addition to climate and resilient benefits. So I'm looking forward to listening to the, the rest of the panel members and uh, looking forward to Q&A later. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Wuchang. Very interesting presentation. Um, I'd like to go back now to Washington, D.C. Sonia Gibbs, um, nice to see you. Good morning or good evening. Um, I've already introduced you as being the head of sustainable finance at the Institute of International Finance. Um, Wu Chong just made the very interesting point that the public sector can't carry this burden alone and the private sector is going to have a big role to play. So the question is, um, how prepared is the private sector to take on this burden? If you could um, give us your presentation, please. Of course, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Anthony and, and the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. It was great to hear Florence and, and Wu Chang. Let me see if I can bring in some private sector perspective here. And I'd like to say we're we're completely ready to step up to the plate, but it's a, a complex and, and, and far reaching landscape, sustainable finance, and there's a lot to unpack. So let me start by saying for anyone who's not familiar, the Institute of International Finance is a global association of financial firms, 450 members, 75 countries across all sectors, banks, asset managers, pension funds, insurers, and so on. And our basic aim is to promote strong public private sector dialogue, solid research, policy analysis, sound capital markets functioning and effective regulation with alignment globally. Those, those points are very important to us and they inform everything we do, including around sustainable finance, the need for global alignment. So really there's no more important topic this year than sustainable finance to do a deep dive on. So well done for choosing this. Mm -hmm. We just have a remarkable confluence of events this year. You have the G20 and the G7, both prioritizing sustainable finance and their agenda. You've heard from the IMF, the ADB, multilateral development banks, everyone is working up there, ramping up their work on climate risk and climate finance. The standard setters, the BAL committee, the IAIS, IOSCO, all of the standard setters are likewise focusing in more on, on climate risk. And the US importantly is back at the table in these policy discussions. So I wanna make four, four sets of, uh, four, four points in, in my remarks. First, to emphasize how off track we're getting in financing the sustainable development goals. Second, some considerations on the role of the private sector in scaling up sustainable finance. Third, on the importance of disclosure. And Wu Chang mentioned uh, a number of factors there and I'll make a few more points. 
And finally, the importance of global alignment in sustainable finance policy and regulation and kind of some of the implications of, of where the US is heading on, on domestic and international climate finance policy. Views from Washington DC, as it were. So on the uh, sustainable development goals, look, I mean, with less than 10 years left to achieve them, this COVID-19 pandemic has really underscored how fragile our economies and societies are to unexpected shocks. And, you know, as Florence was, was pointing out, there's been unprecedented stimulus packages. However, I think it's really critical to note here that poorer countries are still struggling to find funding. Over 19 and a half trillion in global fiscal stimulus has been announced by governments and central banks, but the average size of the fiscal response has been well, well below that in mature markets. So the, the funding for emerging markets is, is really coming to the fore, that dearth of funding. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that everyone is looking for is a greener and more sustainable post COVID recoveries, so building back better, you know, that very overused phrase, but yet it's so critical. Emerging markets, you know, in, in, in climate terms do account for the bulk of the world's carbon emissions and are going to need an additional two and a half trillion per year to reach the sustainable development goals. So stimulating a flow of capital to emerging markets that's targeted to developing low carbon products, facilitating low carbon business models, this is just essential and it's going to require extensive collaboration and co-financing, blended finance with multilateral and national development banks, governments and a range of other act actors to support sustainable infrastructure and cash flow generating investments, particularly important in, a, in, a, in, in recovering from the, the, uh, the deep, deep contractions that we've had. Looking for more sustainable growth models in both emerging and mature markets is also driving improvements to the regulatory and policy framework and prompting companies around the world, both financial sector and non-financial corporate sector to set really ambitious net zero and net negative, you know, in a race to the top emissions targets and allocating more capital to green and socially beneficial investments. So ESG considerations incorporated into all kinds of financing and investment decisions, uh, including the massive fiscal and monetary policy responses to COVID, although, the percentage of those that can be classified as green is pretty small. Um, I wanted to mention one area that we feel is, is rapidly gaining momentum, and this is voluntary carbon markets. These offer tremendous opportunities for the private sector to scale up the use of carbon offsets. As a complement, I should note, to cutting emissions. So this is not some sort of trying to escape cutting emissions, but for many industries, hard to abate industries like you know, transportation, heavy industry, um, you're just not gonna be able to simply slash emissions in the way that would work toward the, the Paris alignment. You need also uh, carbon offsets. So um, we have, we are, we at the IIF is sponsoring a task force on scaling voluntary carbon markets that was uh, initiated by Mark Kearney and um, has very strong support. We have, gosh, close to 200 people across our task force and consultative group here with the goal of massively scaling up voluntary carbon markets. Now, obviously these are just one part of the equation, a global carbon price, and Florence made this point, would make a big difference in the effective assessment and pricing of, of carbon risk. So the financial sector, you know, obviously climate is a key priority. Uh, mainly because you know, that's been the, the top-down push from policymakers and regulators to focus on climate. The S and the G of ESG, the social and, and governance opportunities in funding new innovations, new technologies, and you know, creation of jobs, importantly, is, is rapidly growing in focus. Also, natural capital and biodiversity risks have been getting more attention. So all of these are linked together. I wanted to just say just a few words about disclosure in all of this. I think our, our, our chairman recently gave us a directive that said, there's nothing more important <laughs> for you guys to be working on than uh, a push toward harmonization 
in ESG disclosure standards. Because, you know, without that, you know, you, you're comparing apples and oranges, you do not have the basis for sound risk assessment and pricing of both risks and opportunities. So you need good data. Data gaps are a huge problem in any area of risk management, but for climate and ESG risks, it's especially problematic. You know, the data we need are, are often not comparable, incomplete, missing altogether, can be very expensive to get data. I'm happy to say that across the, the, the world in, in a range of conversations with both public and, and private sector actors, there's a great willingness to sort of band together to combat this, this data problem. Data are also expensive. So I think there'll be a lot of work this year. The NGFS, the Network for Greening the Financial System, Central Banks and Supervisors has an active work stream. I think the, the IMF is, is co-chairing this work stream with the ECB to help address this problem. The Federal Reserve, which has recently set up a supervision climate committee at the Fed, that's also one of the first things they're gonna be looking at. So the data problem is, is front and center. Same thing with metrics and methodologies. How do you measure climate risk? How do you do scenario analysis? How do you promote alignment on these two things? Because if you are, from, from the perspective of a global financial firm, if you're being asked to, to make these assessments and do this kind of risk management, you cannot do it 40 different ways in 40 different jurisdictions. If the monetary authority in Singapore is doing one thing, the Bank of England another, you know, the Fed another still, you know, the result is chaos. We need, we need alignment on, on these things. And there's okay. basically two, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. Are you no, call, sorry. calling time on me? Uh, sorry, ha have you finished now or uh, do you have more? No, no, I was, I was wondering if I had run out of time. Well, no, three minutes is fine. <laughs> Perfect, I'll finish up quickly. Okay. <laughs> um, equally in taxonomy and investment terminology, product labeling and all of that, we need um, to be speaking a common language. Those efforts are hugely important, but it's very difficult, right? Because for example, a European approach to taxonomy that is very kind of, voluminous and one might say prescriptive might be at odds with how, for example, the US might uh, view this same question on taxonomy. So finding that alignment is going to be elusive. Um, so let me just finish by saying a few words about the need for a well-aligned regulatory and policy framework. The main concern is clearly fragmentation. You know, inconsistency across jurisdictions is going to be really detrimental to our goal of scaling up climate finance, there needs to be a, a consistent framework. Um, and to, to, I wanted to bring the kind of US context into this, this conversation because part of the reason that the current framework around sustainable finance policy and regu regulation is inconsistent and fragmented has been the absence of the US from these discussions. So with the return of the US and the Biden administration, I think we could really be on the brink of a, of a sea change in sustainable finance policy. As you all know, I'm sure the President Biden and his team have set out a really ambitious climate agenda. We joined the Paris Agreement, we have a very, very extensive plan to spur the transition to clean energy, net zero by 2050 and much more. Now it's important as, as I'm sure many of you know, <laughs> Green fiscal stimulus, you've got to work with Congress. And, uh, you know, it, it, legislation is going to be difficult. The Biden administration does have a lot of uh, regulatory authority on, on its own through the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act, and so on to do things like regulate emissions. Um, but really, I think what we're seeing is that the Biden administration is elevating climate across all agencies of the US government. So we have the new Fed. Uh, Supervision Climate Committee, senior appointments at the Securities Exchange Commission, the SEC, and, you know, very senior appointments in the White House. Former Secretary of State John Kerry, Special Envoy for Climate. climate. Gina McCarthy is the first ever um, White House National Climate Advisor. And so this gives tremendous opportunities for U.S. leadership at the international level, whether that's G20, G7, regional forums like APEC, Financial Stability Board, the Ball Committee, 
all of this is, is, is great opportunity. So in partnership with, Euro with Europe, with Japan, with other forward-leaning jurisdictions, this could make a tremendous contribution toward closing the, the SDG gap by fostering a better aligned global regulatory and policy framework, helping unlock both public and private investment to support the SDGs. So I'll stop there, Anthony. Thank you very much, Sonia, very interesting. Okay, um, as you say, it's good news that the US is back, um, but China obviously also is going to be a very important, powerful force in shaping the success or failure of um, the fight against climate change. So let's move to Mr. Frank Bellitz in Beijing. Um, can you give us the AIIB perspective, please? All right, thank, thank, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the, the invitation. And uh, I mean, one of the reasons we, we very often say yes to these events is it's, it's very much a learning experience from, from our you know, esteemed peers, uh, particularly the depth of, of analysis and, and knowledge. Uh, and let me perhaps just spend a couple of minutes to, to put that statement into context in relation to, to what the AIIB is uh, and what it is not. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, we, we are a relatively young uh, organization, uh, five years old uh, this year. Um, and we are only focused on infrastructure and the greater Asian region. Uh, and that, that's quite an important distinction. Um, and it's also, I think, one of our, um, our strengths because we are able to, to, to mobilize all of our resources and, and all of our activities and focus into just infrastructure and the Asian region. In terms of the, the greater topic of, of climate, climate change and the impact, I mean, I think it's, it's very important uh, that, that we do look at it and that we do look at it very seriously. And I'll, I'll come to how we are in, in a minute. Um, but, you know, if, if we look at the impact of climate on the Asian region, uh, I mean, we, we are uh, active in one of the most uh, impacted regions of, of the world. If we're looking at uh, impact on, on human life, on human livelihoods, uh, on, on development for, for us. So, so climate is very much front and center in our, our way of thinking. Um, the, the other difference that I'd just like to, to add is in what we do. So we, we finance in, at the heart of it. We are a, a, a multilateral development bank that finances infrastructure. Projects, but we finance across the whole spectrum. So from, from sovereign back lending all the way to, to direct equity and everything in between. However, we do, we do recognize that uh, you know, in, in relation to the financing needs, uh, we, we are a drop in the ocean. Uh, and therefore, we're very cognizant of the, the need to partner, to mobilize, to use our, our name and our resources to, to demonstrate to have both uh, more financial resources, but also uh, the sharing of, of data, the sharing of information and the sharing of, of opportunities. Um, we have recently uh, developed and agreed our first corporate strategy, uh, which is based on the concept of IT, so infrastructure for tomorrow. And it's not, it's not just a slogan. Uh, it does actually uh, embed quite a lot of, um, of, of concepts. And in particular, it, uh, it highlights four thematic priorities that we are focusing on. Uh, one is capital mobilization, and that's not just at the project level, but also at the sector level, but also in terms of trying to create interest for infrastructure in emerging markets and in Asia. The second priority is uh, technology. And, and uh, in particular, realizing that the, the infrastructure sector has really lagged behind in the application of the benefits of technology. Now, whether that's digital or whether that's simple things around uh, energy efficiency, uh, water use efficiency, um, how, how can we better mobilize the benefits of, of technology? The third is connectivity. Uh, and this is very much in the DNA of the, of the bank in, in terms of promoting multilateralism and connectivity within Asia and Asia to, to the rest of the world. 
And embedded in there is, is also this concept of, of the greater public good, uh, which, which ties in with our focus, for example, on, on renewable energies, on pollution emissions, uh, clean air, and, and so on. And the last one, uh, and this sort of leads into the, the three questions you, you asked of, of us, is the thematic priority of ground green uh, infrastructure. And embedded within green infrastructure is the focus on, on climate. Specifically, uh, we have developed a, um, a climate finance target, which is to, to reach 50% uh, climate finance uh, of our approved amounts by 2025 as a minimum. Um, and I'm happy to say that uh, last year we reached uh, 41%. So despite the, the, the impact of the COVID situation, uh, we, we are able to, to still um, you know, progress our, our share of, of climate finance. Um, you, you asked us the question about how important a priority is climate change for, for the AIIB. Look, I, I, I would say and answer that first by saying that it's climate change is, is seen by us as a paramount challenge uh, of the 21st century. Uh, it's become a top priority for many of our members. Um, and I think it's, it's now associated very much not, uh, with, with the whole concept of, of development. So it's no longer a standalone issue. It's, it's integrated into uh, countries' uh, development plans. Uh, and, and we see that on a practical level in their financing uh, requests to us. Um, I'd go a step further and say that uh, even in the, the original articles of, uh, of agreement of the bank, which were actually agreed just a few days after the, the Paris Agreement, um, the, the, the concept of fostering sustainable economic um, development is, is, is embedded in the, in the first articles of the bank. And therefore, uh, we, we actually have the mandate to and, and the responsibility to, to address climate change. Um, so I think, I think the, the, the new 50% uh, financing uh, target is a, is a demonstration of our ambition, but also a demonstration of our responsibilities. So what we are doing now at, uh, at a practical level is aligning our, our systems, our procedures, our uh, financing methods with um, with the requirements of, of financing climate change across mitigation, adaptation, and, and resilience. Um, we can also see it, though, uh, at a practical level as, as it's embedded in all of our sector strategies. So whether it's energy or water or, or transportation, there is a requirement for our banking teams to, to focus on, on climate change. Um, the second question you asked of us was, um, how can MDBs best coordinate their activities? Uh, look, I, I think um, have, have being a member of, of many of the, the joint MDB working groups, um, yeah, I, I can see a lot of the work that goes on in the background, which I think uh, often is, is not talked about um, and is, is, is not seen. Um, but I, I can assure uh, the, the participants here that, that there is a lot of coordination already between the, the MDBs, uh, particularly, you know, on, on the sort of things that, uh, that needed, are needed to be done in order for the MDBs to properly mobilize their, their resources. And, and here I mentioned things like, you know, developing um, uh, mitigation and adaptation methodology so that we're actually able to to account for what we do in a consistent manner. Um, but let's also remember that, that uh, climate change, you know, is probably a classic example of the, the, the tragedy of the commons. So the, the other role of, of MDBs is, is ensuring that we have a consistent message uh, and that we, we assume uh, global leadership in, in maintaining and developing the momentum towards mobilizing finance for, for climate change. Um, but I, I, I also think we, we try very much to, to go beyond that um, and to say that it's not just a matter of, of mobilizing finance, but also mobilizing um, you know, the intellectual resources, the, the innovation that, that uh, can be put to work in, in, in combating climate change. Um, 
The third question that you asked of us is our view on progress made so far by, by Asian countries. And here I'd, I'd like to sort of echo the, the words of our, my colleague from, from the ADB and, and, and you know, the, the announcements that are coming out of the, the leading countries of the Asian region are certainly very, very welcomed. Um, and we, we see that they, they are, you know, they, they have been taken note of in, in our member countries. Um, and we, we hope by focusing on these announcements uh, and, and what is behind the announcements that we can actually stimulate a sort of snowball effect in, in, in the rest of the region. So we're seeing this now, for example, with the, the carbon tax initiatives coming out of Singapore uh, and, and, and Malaysia is also discussing certain initiatives. So there's a, there's a growing momentum. Um, but I think um, it's, it's also fair to say that perhaps, you know, more needs to be done now. It's, it's, it's very good to have targets, but what is really behind the targets? Because I think that's then when people start to, to become really interesting. What, what, what does it mean to me? What does it mean to my bottom line? Um, how can I, can I mobilize this? How can I make, uh, you know, how, how can I benefit from this? Um, and maybe there the four, four quick points that, that we focus on. One is policy alignment. Um, the, the policy of countries really need to be aligned with uh, the statements. Uh, unfortunately, we as an institution, we, we don't become involved in policy development, um, but we recognize that it is absolutely crucial to, to provide that policy and regulatory umbrella in order to, to make the most out of the financing that we are able to, to mobilize. The second one is, is around private sector engagement and mobilization. Um, you know, mobilizing finance pub and private finance is, is obviously going to be a key to addressing the, the huge financing requirements, but it's actually not enough. Uh, it's, it's not enough to focus just at the project level. We, we have to really make it mainstream. And here we, we, you know, we, we talk a lot to insurance companies, for example, on how they model climate change risk how they, uh, how they translate that into their, their insurance premium. How can the ultimate uh, owners and beneficiaries of, of infrastructure assets, for example, the long-term institutional investors, really start to become involved at the beginning of, of infrastructure development by, for example, insisting on climate resilience um, um, add-ons. Um, three minutes, please, if you don't mind, three minutes. Okay. Um, just finishing, thank you. Um, the third one is on, on partnerships and, and innovation. And again, here, it's, it's, it's making sure that everybody works to, together to share experiences and, and, and data and, and, and knowledge and make sure that it comes to uh, the people who, who actually need it. And my last point is, is really, um, we talk a lot about climate change. We talk a lot about climate mitigation. Um, we, we don't talk so much about the more proactive uh, climate adaptation and climate resilience. So what can we do that, that goes above and beyond uh, the baseline uh, climate mitigation and actually make, uh, particularly in our case, the infrastructure, but then at a bigger level, uh, economic development, climate resilient. Um, so with that, thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, well, let's turn to questions. Um, questions from the floor, if we have any, if anyone has questions or online, is there, uh, if there's no immediate question, I, I'd like to ask a, a question um, of the all of the panelists, which is really can be summed up in three words, who's in charge? I mean, Obviously, the institutions that you represent, the panelists, have been doing some incredible work on this, and there are so many other organizations and governments are making commitments and so on. But, you know, basically, we all live under the same sky and we all are surrounded by the same sea, so to speak. So is there a need, you think, for a new multilateral or multinational agency to somehow coordinate this? Because sometimes looking in from the outside, it does seem that there is not enough global coordination, or am I wrong? Uh, let's start off with um, maybe Sonia on that. Sonia. I'm happy to take a first crack. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. everybody else will want to comment. I think that's the best question I've ever heard on this topic, who's in charge? Um, look, everybody has a piece of the puzzle, right? Everybody has 
their turf. Everybody has national interests. Everybody has institutional interests. To get everybody on the same page is tremendously difficult. However, I, I would venture to say that a new kind of international coordination body is exactly what we don't need. I think what we need is to make better use of the, the systems that we have already in place for coordination. And toward that end, I'd highlight, and, and maybe Florence, you can say a few more words about this. I believe that the G20 this year, one of the things that they're gonna be looking at in coordination with the IMF and other multilaterals is exactly that, a way to sort of better coordinate international policies. Mm. Okay, thank you. Wu Chong, do you have a view on that? Wu Chong Wu? Yes, um, yeah, it is a good, good, great question. And I completely agree with Sonia on this one. Um, I mean, the people have to be in charge at the end of the day and, and through the countries. And we have enough organizations that are looking at uh, these issues. And if you create a new entity, what's gonna happen, it's gonna, it's gonna take us five years to set it up. And you're gonna put all these people from existing agencies to go there and then cannibalize and talk about the same thing all over again. So. What's great news is that, you know, since the climate investment funds work, um, the the MDBs, for example, we've been working really closely. It started with the five the MDBs and now the AIB and everybody else is involved. And there's such a great coherence. And in fact, um, ADB is chairing this MDB working group on climate for this first half of the year. And then, um, and there's such a great collaboration. We can call each other anytime and we know exactly what we are trying to do. So this ambitious, um, effort to align ourselves with Paris alignment, which is actually wider than climate finance per se. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a, such a great coherence. So I think definitely adding um, one more layer of uh, another agency would probably kind of backfire in what we're trying to do. Okay. Florence or Frank Babitz, do you have a, a comment on that? Please. No, Thanks. Florence, no. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of the points have been made. I mean, I, I agree that creating a new multilateral agency is, is, is probably not a good idea. Uh, we have, you know, it takes a long time to establish a new institution, to get, you know, to staff it, to get it to work together. Um, I think, I mean, the multilateral kind of institution we have is this Paris Agreement, you know, which the countries are working on now to try to uh, fill up their, their ambitions. And as Sonia mentioned, the G20 this year is looking into how to better coordinate you know, the, the international policies that are being taken, hopefully with, um, you know, as an outcome, uh, a strengthening of the commitments countries are, are with. Okay. I think you've cut off. Um... We can't hear Florence for the moment. So, um, Frank Bellitz, you have a sure. No, look, I, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, with my other three colleagues, and uh, oh. I think we're all violently in, in in agreement. Um, I, 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 I do think so. So, building on the you know the, the momentum um, of the Paris Agreement and of COP is is is, is crucial. But I think we, we really need to have a very uh, good understanding of what role everybody can play. Um, and then to, to focus on, on allowing those players to, to, to actually act. And, and climate change in the end is, is, is a great example of the need for, for multilateralism. So, uh, you know, it's, um, we, we do need to understand each other on this one. Okay. So questions from the floor? No, on the floor? Um, oh, yes, um, Rosal, please. Please, as usual, state your name and identity and stick to one question, please. We've... My name is Kurt Sieber. I'm an associate member. First of all, thank you so much for having done this uh, project and uh, has been extremely uh, elaborating myself in my in my mind i have a very practical question uh, which can be started immediately and also refer strongly about japan um, th there is still a lot of investment going into coal which is really the major problem uh, in the uh, 
emissions and uh, so um, there have been many many banks all over the world now who have been stopping but there are still many remaining and there are still a lot of loopholes uh, which by such and such thing you can do it and uh, of course in Japan we have the problem that there are still about 50 to 20 um, uh, coal-fired pro uh, projects uh, which are now in the doing or in the planning and this is really one of the first things which should be stopped and the, the banks can be very strongly involved in that. Uh, so what's your opinion on this subject? Thank you. Okay, I should have mentioned at the start that we do, we do have a further event in two weeks time, which will focus specifically on Japan. But this question of coal and its uh, contribution, if that's the right word to pollution is very important. So any general views on whether enough attention is being paid to the problem of um, coal fired power stations and so on. I'm not sure who perhaps, um, um. Uh, yes, Sonia, you want to... I, I should probably at least tackle it since the word banks was, was put into okay. the, the, the question. Mm. This, is, this is one that comes up quite a lot, and I, I mm. broadened the context of the question well beyond Japan, because oh. in many emerging markets, you know, that's a, a primary source of energy. And even in, in the U.S. here where, where we are, there's tremendous debate over the role of banks in financing the, the energy sector, and it's more... I think polarized than it is in, in say Europe where the conversation is more advanced. Look, I think it comes down primarily to a question of transition. And I think we, we need to, to get more comfortable with this concept of transition finance. Mm. It would be great if we could simply kind of turn off the taps. And, and, and I also wanna make the point that the financial sector is an intermediary, right? We, we intermediate finance. We, if you want to, to regulate or stop or control emissions, the answer is not to, to tell the financial sector not to finance this, that, or the other. It's to, to regulate directly, but that's very politically difficult. So often financial regulation is seen as sort of the, the cure to this. However, you do that, and it, especially in, in poorer countries, you create massive unemployment, you create massive economic disruption. It's not that simple. So I think the solution has to be working with these industries to green them. And that gets to kind of shades of green, right? And we don't want to do sort of brown financing. That's a very bad thing. And we want to avoid that wherever possible. We want to encourage these uh, brown industries to become you know, dark green, olive green, lighter green, and then very green indeed. But it's a process that takes time. Okay, and it, so it's a balancing act, right? You get the urgency of the, the climate need, but you also have, you know, where we are here and now. Okay. Uchang, very briefly, anything new from you on coal and the problem of pollution that it causes? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, first of all, I really like the expression shades of, shade of green. Um, so it, it is a, a big challenge because as, as Sonia said, you can't just turn off the light for everybody. And, and it's like, we need to change the engine while still traveling in 60 miles an hour. So, so the role that we can actually play in ADB or other multilateral development banks is to build the capacity of the countries uh, in whether it's a policy, policy framework or whether it's a technical capacity to really push the renewable energy. And, you know, 2009, when we established our existing energy policy, you know, it's technically not possible to uh, meet the base load uh, for, uh, using just the renewable energy, but now the technology has really, really improved. So uh, we are putting a lot of effort to, um, um, to push that technology out. So, you know, so with support from Japan, uh, we've set up a high level technology fund, which is precisely to do that, to crowd in the new, uh, you know, the new technical idea, technological ideas to um, pilot test in our developing countries, in the poorer countries, even in the remote, the most remote countries uh, where we can deploy uh, new technology, including in the in re renewable energy and energy efficiency space, mm -hmm. but still a long way to go. Thank you. Um, okay, last call for questions. Um, I, Carlton, you have a question? Yes. Do you have a question? Could you go to the microphone there, please? Thank you. 
thank you. I just read today in the news that uh, the, the central banks are borrowing money uh, a lot, especially in Japan, uh, to finance the COVID effects and support measures. For example, they say Japan now is uh, debt with $11 trillion debt. So how those banks, regional banks, uh, such ADB or uh, ADB, the other one, can uh, help in this uh, pandemic uh, times? Thank you. So, sorry, can help to do what? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear what the mask did. <laughs> how can they help in uh, uh, facing up the, the financial crunch uh, uh, and the uh, very high debt by the government um, uh, to face the, the think, coronavirus. I'm not sure if this question is related, but it, I think this is an important point. Maybe well, it, it, it is important, but uh, if you don't mind, I don't think it's you know strictly connected to climate change, if you don't mind. Um, I, I have one quick question, which is, that very many people now want to invest in climate change alleviation. They're very keen to do it, whether they're small investors or major institutions. And they get mainly into ESG investment, which is becoming very big. But is ESG really the answer? I mean, it's, it encourages good corporate behavior, but do we need a more direct way in which ordinary people, ordinary investors, if you like, can invest in the business of alleviating climate change. Sonia, again, a quick comment from you, if you would. Very quickly on that, I, I think ESG, the difficulty is that you need to broaden the definition of it, right? I mean, ultimately, everything needs to be ESG'd, you know, made more environmentally, socially, and, and, and better in terms of, of governance. All investments need to have ESG incorporated into them. Then we won't have any longer this debate about, can you do well by doing good? You know, mm -hmm. do you need to give up returns to invest in, in ESG? Mm -hmm. So I think this is coming and it's, it's, we see it around the world. Okay. Anyone else with a comment on uh, whether the private sector, private investors can make a more direct contribution to alleviating climate change? Um, I mean, whether the, the, the North Social Development Banks, for instance, should sell more climate bonds to investors. Um, is that a possibility? Uh, Wu Chong, uh, perhaps a view from the AIB, the ADB. Oh, yes, you know, certainly there are many ways of doing that and, and, and participating in, in green bond, for example, is, is a, one easy way to go. But, but generally, I, I don't know if you're talking about the small investors or institutional investors, you mm. know, invest in this institutional investors, there are many ways of doing that. Mm. Uh, but even private sector um, you know, smaller ones, you know, there we are trying to finance a lot of uh, small scale uh, renewable energy activities on the ground and, and through the sort of the, the financial subsidiaries. So and perhaps through that, maybe some smaller uh, investors can participate. But in our, in our case, uh, under our strategy 2030, our vision is to increase our private sector lending from 10% to 30% over the next uh, five years. So uh, we'll be looking for every possible opportunity to attract private investors. Okay. Frank Billets, very briefly, finally, you, the AIIB seems to have been doing some rather innovative things in uh, financing uh, generally and including climate uh, change. Um, can you just say a brief word about what you are doing? <laughs> Yeah, sure, and, and maybe it relates to, to your, your previous question. So I, I, I think, and I, I, I totally agree with what Sonia said about you know, ESGing. Um, and and it, it, it's the same with our institutions. I mean, we, we see ESG as a baseline. So anything we do, we should not be doing any evil um, or, or any harm, should we say. Um, so, but, but that's ESG for us. Um, going over and above, the, is, is adding the, the, the real uh, sort of more proactive benefit. Um, and, and here, uh, I mean, we, we come at it uh, in, in terms of trying to, to demonstrate the, the, the value of doing so. So Wu Chong mentioned, you know, all of these opportunities of investing into solar parks and, and, and renewable energies. That, that, that's fine. People don't always make the, the, the immediate link with climate change, but it is obviously a, a contributor. 
Um, the other thing that we're trying to do is, is to, to, to really go, uh, is to change the thinking into longer term. That's what I was trying to say in my opening statement by, by really demonstrating the, the, the bottom line impact of putting in adaptation and resilience measures uh, from, from day one. Uh, you know, how can we increase the lifespan of, of infrastructure? How can we make it more cost efficient? How can we increase the, the returns? Um, and this should be of benefit to, to the ultimate long-term owners. Um, and then lastly is, is this market creation. And I think here we're, we're also working with the ADB on, on creating uh, climate bonds, uh, climate portfolios. Uh, we're currently working on a concept of a, of a sustainable bond framework. Um, so it's, it's, it's really bringing in the, the, the capital markets to, uh, to the climate debate as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. We've only been able to scratch the surface of this climate change issue. There will be another event in two weeks time, which will focus more on Japan. I hope you'll join us for that. And finally, let me again thank the panelists. Uh, thank you, Florence. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Wu Chong. And thank you, Frank, uh, for coming and being with us uh, at you know, different times of the day. So with that, um, we have to end this, the webinar here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here.